Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise Amen. 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 How is everyone doing this afternoon? Amen. We doing okay? Yes. Amen. We thank the Lord for the prayer said by the elder. And I want to welcome each of us who have chosen to come and fellowship with us this afternoon. Feel most welcome. And for those of us who are fellowshiping with us for the first time, uh, feel much welcome. And there is a special time when your presence is going to be recognized. And Mr. Jackis is going to help us lead us into that. We'll be sharing this afternoon from the book of Luke. Uh, chapter number 18. Therefore, turn with me if you can get your scripture or you are or, or you are on the papers that are provided for us. Turn to the scripture of the reading today. Luke chapter number 18. Luke 18, verse verses beginning from verse number 9 to verse 14. Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. Are we there? Are we? Amen. Thank you. Mr. Jackie, so you please read for us. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. Amen. Pray. Father, indeed, like a tax collector, none of us, so Father, is merited to be in this place. And therefore, Lord, we need your mercies. We need your grace, your forgiveness. And Father, be gracious to us and send us your word in your love, in your power, and in your care for us. To the glory of your name, Holy Spirit, take over. In your holy name, Lord, do I believe and pray. Amen. Amen. It's an interesting church prayer meeting of the tax collector and the Pharisee in there. And it depicts... Uh, what Christians look like today in our fellowship with God. And I believe that you and I have this desire too, which is a desire to every believer. That we live a life which gives forth fruits of righteousness. And indeed, living a life that gives fruits of righteousness is a desire for every single believer. And of course, the goal and the target of every believer who is a committed Christian. We want to live a life that projects forth the Christ who lives in us. I mean, displays the uniqueness of Christ who lives in us. A life which gives fruits which are in accordance to the teachings of the word. That's a life that everyone desires. And of course, it's a life that is expected of us as the scripture teaches us that we have to live a life that gives fruits. Elsewhere, James says that if you are, have faith without the fruits, the works, then your faith is nothing, right? And that, therefore, giving fruits is the goal for everyone to see in life. And as we walk with the Lord every day, when it comes to the times in our personal walk and relationship with God, when we realize that probably we have performed below the standards, or rather below the goal of giving fruits, we feel discouraged internally. That's an experience each one of us goes through. Every believer who is committed, as you walk with the Lord, when we realize that sometimes our performance, rather our life activity, the way we cut out our life, has performed be below the requirements of the Lord, we feel discomfortable inside. 
I mean, we feel these uncomforting sadars, and that is what is explained as being the health Christian life. That everyone who has the Spirit of God in him, whom the Spirit of God directs and guides, whom the Spirit of God instructs, whenever he performs below the expectation of the Spirit of God, he's never comfortable. He feels guilty and sorry, and that guilty draws us back to God, to reconcile us back to God, and even if we've offended each other, that guilt leads us into seeking reconciliation with one another. But there's a problem when this desire to achieve this goal turns out to be the accomplishment, uh, you know, accomplished merits that define who we are. When the desire to perform, to give fruits, when the desire to live a life that de describe us as Christians, when the achievement of giving forth fruits is turned out into the accomplishment merits to describe or to define who we are, it becomes a venomous danger to a life of a believer and even a life of a community of believers. When we begin measuring our spirituality with what we've achieved, oh, I go to uh, Sebe Kido every morning, and therefore I am a good Christian. Oh, I failed to go through to Sebe Kido last Sunday, uh, I mean, last uh, yesterday or the other day, and therefore I feel like I'm, I'm, not, I'm a wretched Christian. You know, it's a positive feeling, a very health feeling, but if at all we describe and define our spirituality and our religious life based on such activities, it turns out to be a poison to ourselves as an individual in our spiritual work with the Lord and also even amongst the body of believers. This is what we mean in this case. If I capitalize my spirituality, the definition of my spirituality on my performance as a Christian, on the fruits that I give as a Christian, the moment I will fail to give those fruits as a human being, I will cut across my spine. I mean, I will feel this discomfort and get into judging and condemning myself to the extent of failing to realize the love and the mercies of God that is always sufficient for me, even in my failures. The parable that we've just heard, which has been read to us, it, protect, I mean, it projects forth this notion of giving forth this, the fruits of the Christian life and a mistake that a Christian can fall into by capitalizing their faith, their spiritual life on the performance righteousness. A righteousness that is described and is built on the performance, on what we do for the Lord, what we do in our Christian life, on what we do in the church or in the Christian community in general. It's a very positive thing. But if at all we capitalize, we define ourselves by what we perform in the eyes of God, intend to imagine that what we perform in the eyes of God answers favor before God, then that turns out to be a mistake in our walk with the Lord. It's a little bit critical, but that's the truth. Let's walk together through the, 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 this parable and we see what the Lord reveals to us. I want to share with us on that topic a righteousness that does not save, a dangerous righteousness in other words. The story has it has gone, the, par the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It says that the two of them went to the temple to pray. And when, when they went to the temple to pray, the first prayer that we have seen in this case is the prayer of the tax, I mean, the, the prayer of who? The Pharisee. And the Pharisee stands before the Lord, uh, his God, the Yahweh God, and tells him the Lord, Behold who I am, as I stand before you. I am a devotee believer of the faith that you've given to us. I keep the law. I fast twice a week. I give tithe of everything that is given to me, everything you give to me, I give it back to you in the tithe as you've instructed me. I'm not like that tax collector. He doesn't even fast. 
he, he gets money out of, uh, he, he, he gets assary out of the illegal ways. I'm not like him. I, I'm better off, therefore. Will you hear my prayer? And the Lord says, uh, the other side, the tax collector, he beat his chest and said, I don't deserve to stand before you because I'm not like him. He's more spiritual than I am. I mean, in other words, I'm paraphrasing this. He looks at himself, and of course, he compares with the righteous requirements of God, and then he realizes that he's nowhere worthy to receive even the crumbs that fall from the table of the master. You remember that story? He's not worthy at all. And he beats his chest. The Bible says he beats his chest and cries before God, like, God, have mercy. And then the Lord says that out of the two, this poor tax collector went away justified. In other words, he went away forgiven. But the Pharisee went away with self-satisfaction. The righteousness that doesn't save. What do I mean by a righteousness that does, does not save? Looking at the life of the Pharisee, we realize that the Pharisee, his lifestyle was in tune or in line with the requirements of God. God had given them the laws, had given the Israelites the law to commit to as the laws which were revealing the will of God to their lives. And every Jewish believer was expected to follow by these laws, which were the requirement of God in his relationship with his people. And anyone who fulfilled this was, of course, meeting the righteous requirements of God. But now the mistake was the, the Jewish people of the time, they turned the gift that God had given, the revelation, the revealing gift that God had given to them to become a personal accomplishment an individual accomplishment. And they began taking pride in what they were fulfilling, in what they were doing, and they even went to the extreme. For instance, the Jewish law required that the, the committed Jewish believer had to fast once in a year. And this was during the Day of Atonement, which was only observed one time in a year. So any religious and devoted religious Jewish member he had to fast once in a year. But how about this Pharisee standing before God? He tells God, you know what? I fast 20, how many times are those? Roughly 26 times in a year. Of course, he fasts twice in a week, and, and if at all the year has, has 360, 60, 60 what day? 63 days, right? 65 days. If the year has 365 days, then he was fasting probably 26 or 27 times a year. While others were only fasting once. You see how spiritual he was. <clears throat> While others were only fasting once in a year, this Pharisee was very committed, was going to the extremes before. I mean, he was going to the extremes in his relationship with God, closer to God. He, he was disciplining himself closely to follow closely the teaching of God. And he says that he tithes everything that God gives to him. Everything that comes his way, he could not utilize it without tithing. That's what he says. And uh, elsewhere in Matthew, Matthew indicates that he did not just tithe, uh, tithe everything that came his way. But everything, including even a single, uh, you know, in Matthew says that, including even the smallest product that came out of his field, he tithed it, anything that came his way, so that he will fulfill the religious requirements of God. But the scripture says that he went away unjustified and compared to the tax collector. <coughs> What is the Lord teaching us in this? There are, when the believers who come to follow the Lord, 
they turn when the believers who come to follow the Lord turn what God has given to them to be the self and an individual accomplishment it drives them away from God's expectation and concentrate on themselves and forget about the masses that God has given as a gift of salvation to them the Pharisees this Pharisee himself, in representation of other Pharisees, he was embracing this self-trust, self-confidence in what God had given to them and what he could be able to achieve by himself and fail to utilize the masses and the grace that God had given to him. And that's what the Lord was warning the believers in this case, was warning the disciples and his followers that watch out, be careful, be careful that we may not fall into the righteousness, the performance righteousness, which is self-righteousness that does not earn one salvation. What are the problems with a performance righteousness? These are the four issues, the four elements that I would like us to look up, to look into as being the detrimental effects of this. Uh, the, performance righteousness. Number one, the performance righteousness creates div I mean, divisive, divisive righteousness, divisive re religiosity or spirituality amongst the body of believers. That when we get to trust in what we can do, we can easily create divisions amongst ourselves as believers. This is how it comes in. The Bible says, as the, the reading opens and says that is, this is what it says, that he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. When one believes in his accomplishment, when we turn our spiritual walk and based on what we can achieve before the eyes of God, the activities that we do for God, it's so easy for us to build pride in what we can do before the Lord. And as we build pride on what we can do for the Lord, it's so easy for us to begin looking at ourselves to be better than others, to be holier than others, to be performer than others. It's so easy for a believer who trusts, who puts trust in what he accomplishes in his relationship with God to begin looking down on others who are not doing that. That's what the Lord is warning us through this parable. The Pharisee, the Pharisees and the Jewish believers, they began very well on a very humble, grateful relationship between God with his people. When he gave them the law, they appreciated and the law was meant to draw them closer in their relationship with their father. The law was meant to draw them closer to God and experience the joy and the blessings God had given to them. But they turned the law into ritualistic accomplishment, something that made them to trust in their own ability and turn away from the masses of God that had provided for them. And we see this one clearly as the, in the prayer of the Pharisee. What does he say? That I am not like the prostitutes. I'm not like the unjust people. And I'm not even like this tax collector. Why? The unjust people do not tithe. The unjust people do not, you know, they don't fast. And even some of my just people fast only once a year. I fast 27 times in a year. You see how the Lord brings out this. You know, it's not wrong for you to fast. It's not wrong for you to tithe as a Pharisee or as a Jew because the law requires of you that. But it's wrong if at all you capitalize what you're doing and draw merits out of that and think that what you're doing qualifies you to be listened to by God. Thinking, what, thinking that what you do earns you any merits, objective merits that God has to listen to you, God has to bless you. Of course, it does not mean that God does not honor what we do before him. It didn't mean that God was not honoring the commitment of the Jewish people to fulfill the requirements of the law. He was honoring that. But the problem with them was that 
they were putting trust in the ability and where they were drawing pride out of that and began ostracizing their fellow members who are performing below the standards. The truth is that as the Lord has called us as believers, all of us as you've come to become Christians, our levels of growth are definitely different. There's some of us who've walked with the Lord for a long time and have grown higher. There's some of us who've walked with the Lord for a long time, but we're still, you know, at that level of crawling. There's some of us who came to the Lord recently and they've grown higher. And there's some of us who, whose level of sanctification is at a particular percentage greater or lower than others. These are the people that the Lord is speaking to us, even in this parable, that we have to be careful. We've got to be careful that the blessings of our growth in the presence of God may not turn out to be an obstacle in our relationship with God, in our enjoying the mercies and the grace that God has given in our responsibilities of helping others in our walk with God. We ought to be careful. That's what the Lord is telling us. And remember one unique thing about this. I told you that the Pharisees did not fall away from the purpose of the law that was given to them from the beginning. They began on a very good, positive, grateful platform. But as they walked on, as they kept on striving to fulfill the requirements of the law, they began becoming the masters of their performance, slowly by slowly. And this is the nature of humanity. As long as we're still in the human form, even in the salvation that God has given to us, it's so easy for us to turn into the performance righteousness and begin looking at others as being weaker than who we are getting into this I'm holier than thou syndrome. The Lord is warning us over that through this parable. A performance righteousness, if at all a believer bases his life, his relationship in what he does, what he has accomplished, it's so easy for pride to encroach in and the pride divides the members of the body of Christ and even that pride in itself destroys an, an individual himself as we're going to see later. Judging others in the Christian, the body of believers comes out of the feeling that I'm better than you. Pride amongst the believers in, in all these social settings, it comes in with a feeling that I'm better than you. I preach every day in the chapel, I mean, in the church, so I'm better than you. No, no. I come to church every Sunday, so I'm better than he who doesn't come to church every Sunday. You might not be so. Yeah, that's what the Lord is telling us. I do Sebe Kino every Sunday, every day, so I'm better than the ones who don't do. No, that's not who you are. That's not what earns your acceptance before God. The scripture does not mean that it's wrong for you to commit to what you're doing. Only be careful that what you do has to operate on the platform of the grace and the mercies given to you. Praise the Lord. Earlier on, the Lord told us in the book of, the very, very book of Luke, when the Lord was talking about the, the parable of uh, the parable of the master and the servant, and then he said that who of you, if at all, he's, uh, he comes from, uh, the, the servant comes from the field, and he sits on the table and he says that, uh, come, let's eat together with you on the table. No, no, he says that, the scripture says that if the master, the servant comes back from the field, he will ask them, the servant to serve him, to prepare the meals for him and serve him, and then after that, it after every service has been done. And then he turned to the disciples and he told the disciples that even you, if you've been able, if you've been enabled to do what you could do, don't take pride in that. Just give back thanks to God that you've done what was meant for you to do. Last Sunday, you remember, when we were talking about the prayer in verse from verse one to verse number number eight, the Lord told us that each one of us 
we receive our acceptance. God hears our prayers on the account that we are his chosen saints. We've been elected by him to belong to him. And he said that the reason why he elected us to belong to him, we are the chosen of God, it is because each one of us has been chosen for a particular responsibility. And that particular responsibility that you've been chosen for, he says that when we pray according to that particular responsibility, he will give us the grace and respond back to our prayers, and he will enable us to perform some particular responsibilities which are set for us. And then when we perform those particular responsibility, pride and credit is not up to us, but the pride and credit is to be taken back to he who has chosen us, because we've only carried out what it was meant for us to do. And that's what the Pharisee forgot. Danger number two of a performance righteousness. One, a performance righteousness rises pride in an individual. Pride that tends to feel like I am holier than thou and ostracizes other people within the body of believers. The danger number two about performance righteousness is that a performance righteousness accords one a blind spirituality. It gives an individual blind eyes on his spiritual reality. When this Pharisee comes before the eyes of before the eyes of God together with a with a with a with a tax collector, you look at the nature of his prayer. What does he concentrate on? He concentrates on what he has done, what he could do. He concentrates on, he concentrates on uh, the, the potentials of his walking with God. And what does he mention? He mentions about fasting. He mentions about tithing. But what about giving alms to the poor? Do you do that? He forgot. Maybe he, didn't, he forgot to mention that. What about what about you are you are less caring about the blind people? Do you care for them, the beggars on the street? Do you care for them? Are you reaching out for them? And wait a minute. What about this and that? He forgot to mention about this, but he only focused on what he could accomplish, what he could do, and that's what he mentions before God. And he looks at himself and he compares himself with a tax collector and like. He doesn't do this, so I'm better than him. A performance righteousness, it gives an, an individual who bases his religious work on what he does, it gives an individual a very impaired sight of who he is, a very blind sight on who he really is as he stands before the eyes of God. We'll get that example down in, uh, in the same, same chapter uh, in the... I think verse number 28, the same chapter number two, or oh, verse 18, yes, from verse 18. You get another Pharisee there, a young ruler, who comes before the Lord Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to see the kingdom of heaven? And then, you see the narrative, the way it flows, and then the Lord tells him, oh, why call me good? It's only one person who is good, who is God. And therefore, if you acknowledge that there is somebody who is good, who is God, then you need to do what God instructs you. And then the Lord responds back to him and is like, okay, do you know what the law says? He's like, oh yes, I know. Honor your mother, your father and mother, and, uh, and do not have any other gods other than me, other than one God himself, and he mentions all this, and what does this young ruler say? Like, oh, of course, I know that. I've been doing that since I was a, ch a child. And then others, the manuscripts, the manuscripts say that Jesus looked at him and he's like, oh, he loved him. Like, oh boy, you, you're doing good. But one thing you need to remember, Go sell what you have and give to the poor. What happened to him? The Bible says that he became furious and he walked away. That was the end of the conversation. He is a representative of the Pharisees. This Pharisee who stands before God and he sees himself to be very holy before God. And he, he sees himself and like, God, I do all this before you. 
But he forgot that just like this Pharisee in verse number, two, number 18 downwards, he was limited in other ways. He wasn't perfect at all. He, only, he was only able to accomplish some other areas, but he was imperfect in other areas. But his concentration and his standing before God was focused on what he could do alone. But he forgot to mention about the other weaknesses. But the tax collector, he poured himself. He exposed his weaknesses before God in this case. And the Bible says that the tax collector went away forgiven. Basing our spiritual work on the performance righteousness, on what we can perform, what we do, what we've accomplished in our work with God, it's so easy to blinden our eyes on what we are failing before God. And we go on standing on the podium and we go judging others like, oh, he doesn't do that. Like, oh, Mr. Maslow comes to the church with a t-shirt. I come to the church with a suit. I'm, I put on suit so I'm holier than him. Like, How can you come to my church in t-shirts? <laughs> and maybe my, my, my stocking inside is torn. And I, I don't, I'm forgetting to that my stocking is torn inside. It has some, some, some loopholes. That's what the Lord is telling us that you know, perfect. Don't count on what you are performing and feel like you're holier than other persons. No, we aren't. As much as I'm able to do one thing, I have a failure on the other side. As much as he has a failure on that side, at least he has some goodness on the other side. That's what the Lord is telling us. That every individual, as long as we are still on this pilgrimage, we haven't attained our perfections. Our perfection. We are weak in one way, even though we are strong in one way. That's what the scripture defines and says that each one of us is undergoing the sanctification period. We are being sanctified. We are being made like in the Christ-like image. We are all on this walk. Though we might differ in our heights, but we are all in this walk. So you have no reason to take pride in what you can do. You have no reason. You have no reason to stand on what you can do, if at all, you know, you're good at keeping quiet in the, amidst the fights. And when I see Sister Grace fighting back when the quarrels are coming up, and I was like, are you a Christian? Why can't you behave like a Christian? No, okay, it's, it's okay, it's okay. What about you on the other side? Praise God. The Lord is telling us through this parable that we have to realize that we all have weaknesses. And instead of concentrating on our performance, realize our need for the mercies of God. It's not bad to pursue the religious requirements of delivering fruits of righteousness. It's not bad. That's not what God is discouraging us from doing. But only don't make your pursuits on the religious requirements to be a center of pride because your salvation is not based on that. You go weaknesses another way out just like another person has. The problem number three about the performance righteousness. Number one is that the performance righteousness easily brings in pride that divides. Number two, the performance righteousness easily blinds our spiritual sight before God. And point number three is that the performance righteousness it makes us it makes an individual to be spiritual bankrupt data. You know, I I I, I borrowed these words from a, a certain author that I read his book. His name is Darren Block. He was defining about Christianity and the Christian life, and he say he said that uh, he said that uh, when uh, when Christians tend to believe in what they can perform, what they can do, it makes them to become spiritual bankrupt debtors before God. You know, you know, an individual who has become bankrupt. If you declared bankrupt, you don't have peace. You don't have freedom of yourself. 
you are, if you are a debtor and at the same time you're bankrupt, you don't have freedom of yourself. All the time you are under tension. And that's a similar way an individual who focuses on doing and performing in the eyes of God. That person who focuses on performing in the eyes of God, he always strives all the time to deliver in accordance to the requirements of the law. All the time, this person has never come to the level of enjoying the privilege of salvation. Why? Because you always feel like you're lacking in the presence of God. This is a little bit positive, but it has the weightier part of it. Romans mentions about this. In Romans chapter 14, verse 4, he says that he who strives to live by the law or the commandment of God, he has to fulfill it completely. Because if he fails to complete it, to fulfill it completely, he will always feel this sense of lacking and this sense of, the sense of being indebted to fulfilling this. And that's a similar way. A person who centers his relationship with God upon the fulfillment or the performance of what is required of him. If at all, I say that God accepts me because I am doing this and that and that, then I will be required always to live by that particular commitment. If I fail to fulfill that, then I will feel within me that kind of unrestness within me. That kind of being indebted before the eyes of God. And that is why the Lord, in his love, actually, there is, you know, there is the aspect of love being brought out of this. Out of his love, he's inviting us to get out of this performance righteousness because it only makes us to be debtors who will never be acquitted in the eyes of God. That will be always required to give back. But that's not what the Lord has come for. The Lord says that I, I have come to find the sick that they may have the freedom. He invites us and he says that, come to me all of you who are heavy laden and find rest in me. He says that, take off my yoke because my yoke is easy. Why is it easy? You trade your burden to me and I give you the freedom. That's all that is required of you. The performance righteousness always makes one to live under being indebted in performing and fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law. And then finally, the last problem about the performance righteousness is that this performance righteousness eventually, eventually destroys an individual. We've had you might have not heard about this, but, but some of us might have heard about, about cases where people who've worked with God at the very high levels, trusted in what they could do, falling down to the lowest level and giving up on their spiritual lives. We've had such a case, it's quite common. What happens? It is because when they have walked at the heights of the spiritual lives, and then it happens that they fall down, they don't have the guts to rise up anymore. Why? Because what they trusted in as the righteous and very spiritual people up there, they cannot stand the shame of rising back again. What they do eventually is giving up on their spiritual life. The scripture says, besides that, the scripture says that the tax collector went away forgiven, but the Pharisee went away unforgiven. And as you read at the end of it all, at the end of that parable, it says that he who humbles himself, he is exalted by receiving the masses and justification of God. But he who raises himself higher, he is lowered down by God. Performance, righteousness, easily destroys an individual. To destroy an individual in a manner that he who bases himself on performance, he will never attain the requirements of the performance. He will keep on striving and striving and striving and eventually destroys himself without enjoying the grace that is given to him. 
but the scripture reveals to us the purpose why Jesus came. It is that he may give his grace, his mercy to an individual. And therefore, as he teaches us in this parable, he tells us that disease, flee away, be careful, watch out as a believer. Do not fall into the problem of performance righteousness. Because performance righteousness will not earn you salvation. It will only destroy the relationship amongst you with your people. It will only add pride in you that will deviate you from the proper sight of who you are in your standing before the Lord. Performance righteousness will only kill you at the end of it all because you will never fulfill the requirements of the law. Therefore, the Lord is inviting us through this parable in his love. He's giving us a precaution as you walk every day as believers, we've got to be careful. Because the performance righteousness does not just erupt at once, but it gradually gets to be formed in the life of a believer if a believer is not watchful. And therefore, we are being called upon to watch out. Watch out and enjoy the mercies that the Lord has given to us. For we've been called to enjoy the freedom, the grace, and the peace that God has given to us. But then that one can only be attained if we don't trust in ourselves, but choose to trust in what the Lord Jesus has done for us. May the Lord bless us as we enjoy our walk with the Lord, trusting upon his mercies and grace, and even counting what we can do in the Lord as best on his grace. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you enable us, O King of Glory, to rise up, to learn and to know how to walk upon the grace that you give given to us. You did not come to find those who are well, but you came to find the sick and whom we are part of that. We pray the Lord you will help us to realize this grace that you have given to us, the mercies you have given to us, the Lord, and that we will be able to walk and enjoy the privileges given to us in your service. We love you, Father. Thank you for your word. Go ahead and accomplish it because you've spoken and you're going to do it. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. May we have the offertory and then we get into the Holy Communion service.